I'm Mandy Aguilar, a librarian at Irving Public Library in Irving, Texas, and I would like to welcome you to NTTBF Presents Level the Playing Field, where we're going to talk about books that revolve around sports. Before we get started, I would like to say thank you to the Friends of the Irving Public Library and Share Tank for sponsoring this panel. And now, welcome to our four fantastic authors. I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your book. And let's start with Shamile. Very good. Hello, hello. My name is Shamile Sayed Mendez, and I am the author of Furia. Furia is set in Rosario, Argentina, which is also the place where I was born. Uh, in Furia, I tell the story of Camila Hassan, a girl who's obsessed with soccer or football, as we call it back home. And she wants to become a professional soccer player, which Argentina exports a lot of. Usually the, the athletes that Argentina exports, though, are all men. And we don't hear a lot about, uh, about soccer player women. But she has this dream that she's been fighting for. And finally, when the book opens, her team has the chance to play a very competitive tournament in which there, there are going to be scouts from all over the world. And this is her uh, big break. But just when things start uh, looking good for her and her team, uh, she starts experiencing a lot of obstacles. Uh, her family are not, uh, they're not encouraging of her desire to, to play soccer. The boy that she loves, who is a professional soccer player in Italy, comes to town and um, and he is perhaps the biggest obstacle in her way. And her story is told with the background of the New Namenos movement that started in Argentina in the year 2014. And it's a story about following your dreams. And it has a big piece of my, of my heart because it's about things that I love, uh, like Rosario and soccer. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll go to Jean. Hi, my name is Jean Wen Yang. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. Uh, I wrote and drew a graphic novel called Dragon Hoops. This is actually my very first uh, nonfiction graphic novel. So it tells the real life story of a high school basketball team out of Oakland, California. They're called the Bishop O'Dowd Dragons. They're out of Bishop O'Dowd High School. I used to be a teacher at Bishop O'Dowd High School. And I don't know if you could tell from looking at me on your computer screen, but I am not an athlete. I've never been an athlete. I grew up actually hating sports and specifically hating basketball because the basketball court was always like this arena of embarrassment for me. Anytime I stepped on, I would end up getting embarrassed. So I'm very surprised actually that I ended up spending five years of my life writing and drawing this. But really what happened was I discovered this amazing story. It's a story about uh, a coach, and a team of players all chasing after the same goal, all chasing after the California State Championship. And it's also about me. I'm one of the characters in the story. Uh, it's about how I became a sports fan. I think anybody who's followed sports for a very long time already knows this, but it took me making a book to, to figure this out. But, but sports really aren't just about sports, right? They're, they're really about life. What happens on that court and on that field is kind of like a miniature version of all the stuff that happens in your life. And I think one of the reasons why I came to love sports so much, I came to love basketball so much specifically, is because I realized that when we watch basketball, we want a little bit of that courage that the players show on the court to kind of bleed into us, into our real lives. Um, I hope that comes through in my story. Again, I'm thrilled to be here with you all to share this time. Thank you, Jean. Um, next, let's go to Victoria. Oh, hi, I'm Victoria Jamison, and I'm also thrilled to be here. Um, so I, my book is called Roller Girl. It's also a graphic novel um, about roller derby. And kind of like Jean, I wasn't an athlete when I was a kid, but as an adult, I discovered the sport of roller derby. So my, my author picture for this book is me playing roller derby in Portland with the Rose City Rollers. And it's definitely a discovery I had later in life about how sports could be fun. <laughs> I think I, maybe I'm um, like imposing my own childhood onto Eugene, but yeah, it was kind of embarrassing. Um, I never thought of myself as an athlete because I wasn't the fastest. And I think I see that with kids now with, um, when I talk to kids about being an artist and a lot of kids think, well, I'm not the best artist, so I'm just not an artist, period. And you kind of forget that you can do things for fun. You don't have to be the best. 
I was never the best roller derby player in the world, but I had so much fun and I learned so much about teamwork and just I found a new part of myself. So that's what Roller Girl is about. It's about junior roller derby and the main character, Astrid, um, discovers roller derby kind of like I did and just discovers a part of herself she's kind of been missing. And it's also a story about friendship and kind of find yourself in those rough and tumble middle school years. So yeah, that's, that's a little background on Roller Girl. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and finally, Donna. Hi, I'm Donna Barba Igueta, and this is my book, Lupe Wong Won't Dance. Uh, Lupe is a 12-year-old girl who is a baseball player, and she plays Little League, So, which is somewhat uncommon for girls to be playing baseball, and they were not allowed to play when I was a child, we weren't allowed to play little league. I, I grew up playing fast pitch and I always wanted to play baseball. My dad was a baseball player and I yearned to do that, but I grew up playing fast pitch instead. But Lupe, um, her the goal of the book and what she wants in life is to meet her idol who plays for the Mariners. He's a pitcher. His name is Fuli Hernandez. And like Lupe, uh, Fuli Hernandez is um, Latino and Chinese. And so she makes this her goal and her uncle says, listen, he's a groundskeeper for the Mariners. So he has an in and he says, if you get straight A's, I will get you in to meet Fuli. And Lupe is on track for her straight A's and she shows up to PE one day and she has to square dance. And this all came about from my kids coming home one day and saying they had to square dance in PE in middle school. I didn't think it was still a thing, but apparently it is. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you had to square dance, but apparently about 50% of people in middle school are still square dancing. And um, so that's Lupe's quandary and she's gonna figure out a way to either get rid of square dancing or conquer it. And it doesn't quite end the way people think, but um, there are some scenes where Lupe is playing baseball and I had to do some research for that because I played fast pitch, but um, it's kind of a good, I think, uh, a, how you can blend our hobbies in life, our sports, how they kind of, they weave their way into our regular everyday life and everything that we do. And we think in, about the people who play sports, we think about them all the time and they just weave their way into, we can sit and daydream in class, and which is kind of what Lupe does. Oh, very good. All right. Um, I've read all four of these books and they were all amazing. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys and get a little bit more into the meat of the stories and some of your inspirations for the books. Um, and I think we will start with um, Victoria. Um, so Roller Girl is about Astrid. And the interesting thing about her for me was that she joined Roller Derby without really knowing how to roller skate at all which is a pretty gutsy move. Um, it's a real fish out of water story. So um, I enjoy those. And I was really worried for her as I read the book because she just has so many bumps and bruises, so many collisions, um, you know, real, uh, real possibility of getting hurt pretty bad. Um, and I was wondering if you drew on any of your personal experiences to make that part of the story if you feel real. Yeah. Well, um, besides playing roller derby, um, you know, roller derby started as an adult sport for women. And a few years into playing, uh, junior derby came about. So in my league, kids as young as seven could start to learn how to play roller derby. So a lot of those kids had no idea what they were doing. Like a lot of them didn't know how to skate. So um, it was really through coaching the junior team that I, because adults, yeah, adults are more nervous. There are plenty of adults who started roller derby who didn't know how to skate either. Um, but I saw such courage in the kids, like, they rebounded from injuries so quickly and a lot of the kids did not know how to skate and they just were like, I'm, like, I'm going to do it anyway. So yeah, I think coaching and being involved with junior derby um, was really inspiring and really helpful in reading the characters. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Donna. So in Lupe Wong Won't Dance, um, as you mentioned, Lupe is a basketball player, I'm sorry, a baseball player, um, and she's a girl in a boy-dominated sport. Um, but instead of writing mostly about baseball, you wrote about the square dancing, um, which is an interesting way to frame your story. 
Um, and I wanted to know why you made that choice. What was it about square dancing that was so compelling that you needed to write about it? Oh, Donna, you are muted. Sorry. <laughs> it happens. Um, all the time to me. Um, I think for me, it was mainly about conflict. And I think baseball comes naturally for Lupe and, you know, her, she feels at home on the baseball field and with her teammates, which is kind of my teammates were my family growing up. And for Lupe, where she, like you talk about a fish out of water is square dancing. And I think when I tried to show that initial scene where the kids find out that they're going to have to square dance, you've got all the sporty kids and they're just looks of horror on their face. Like, Oh my gosh, we're gonna have to hold someone's hand and we're gonna have to dance. It just felt unnatural for them. And so when in writing books, we try to find things that create conflict. And I was like, what better conflict to make a bunch of sporty kids have to dance in PE. And ultimately the, the book isn't just about square dancing. It's kind of about Lupe trying to get rid of the things that seem unfair to her. Or, you know, for me, when we had the square dance, I'm like, well, wait a minute, what does that have to do with me? It's a very specific type of southern activity or at least it was to me at the time I was like why in the heck are we square dancing and I think a lot of kids feel that way but that was why I just felt like there was there would be so much better humor on the page and the book I knew I wanted it to be funny but once I threw those kids into square dancing together it was hilarious I didn't have to do anything they the the characters wrote the book and it was it turned out to be the best decision to put square dancing in as opposed to, you know, anything else, even ballet, whatever square dancing was hilarious. Thank you. Um, I, I will say I laughed out loud a lot while I was reading it. Um, it it's definitely got that middle grade humor <laughs> that even me as a now middle aged person really enjoys. <laughs> so yeah, it made me laugh too. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, all right, Jean, um, as you mentioned, Dragon Hoops is based on real events, um, and it's a basketball season at the high school where you taught for years. Um, and I wanted to know if you could tell us what was so compelling that about these particular players or this particular team that you felt compelled to write that book. There, there was so much. I'll, I'll give you just one example. Um, the head coach is a guy named Lou Ritchie. He and I had been teaching on the same campus for over a decade at the beginning of that season. But we weren't really friends because we were like two really different kinds of people. You know, at, le at least that, it seemed like that to me on the surface. Um, he spent all of his time in the gym and in the PE building. I was over in the uh, computer science wing. You know, our paths really crossed. But as we became friends, I realized he's like one of the most interesting people I know. So um, I would credit him as the beginning of the book. Um, he's not just a coach at Bishop Dad High School. He's also an alum. And when he was a junior in high school, he was actually on the varsity men's basketball team as the backup point guard. They made it all the way to the California State Championship. So this was like the biggest game in 17-year-old Lou Ritchie's life. They played in the Oakland Arena, which until very recently was the home of the Golden State Warriors, really big venue. And with seven seconds left, left the, the Bishop O'Dowd Dragons are down by one. Lou is on the court and somehow he gets the ball in his hand. He puts it up at the buzzer, it goes through the hoop, they win by one. Him and his team are just freaking out on, on, on the court. And then over the intercom comes the ref's whistle. So the ref actually invalidates that shot, the biggest shot of young Lou Ritchie's life. And they end up losing by one. It's the most controversial call in California, you know, high school basketball history, at least according to Lou. So he's telling me this story, like in one of our first meetings, the, the one of the first times we were hanging out, we're sitting in his office. He actually reaches over his desk. He gives me uh, a, a DVD of that game, you know, from like 30 years ago. And he goes, Yang, you take this home and you watch it. And you tell me if his hand, oh, sorry. They, they invalidated that shot because supposedly the, the center of the team had his hand on the rim as the ball was falling through. So he, he's like, you go home and you tell me if that kid's hand was on the rim as that ball was falling through the hoop. So I went home and I watched it. And it's hard to tell. It, it's like... It's very unclear. So that shot 
you know, that happened 30 years ago, that haunted his whole life. I feel like a, a huge chunk of his life was about ki kind of like trying to redeem that shot, you know? So he comes back as a coach and as a coach, he leads five different teams to the California state championship. He loses all five times. One of the reasons why I wanted to follow him that season was because that was like the best team he'd had in a really long time. And supposedly it was his best shot at finally redeeming that shot. And I wanted to find out if he was able to do it. So that's, that's like the beginning. But as I, as I went through the, the season with that team, I just found it was like a story fractal. Like there are all sorts of these little stories in this big story about the team. Very good. All right. Um, and for Shamile, um, Furia is set in your hometown in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And the way that you have incorporated the setting into the story was really amazing. Um, when I was reading it, I felt like I was right there um, on those streets um, in, in those that patchy football pitch. Um, can you talk a little bit about setting the story there and what, what you chose to include and, and, uh, and exclude and whether you were worried at all if American readers would have trouble getting into that setting, if they might think it was too foreign, um, I would really love to know your thoughts. I love that question because setting is a, one of my favorite topics to talk about. All my favorite books have a setting that's so unique and compelling that seems like a character. In fact, one of my favorite books of all times, uh, The Shadow of the Wind, is set in Barcelona. And the way that I read it over and over again I had never been in Barcelona before, and one time I had the chance to go with my husband, and I was guiding him all through the town, and he kept looking at me, and then he finally asked, were you here in another life, maybe, because he knew that I had not been there before, but it was just that I had read the book, and, and the author had done such a good job in showing the city and the things that he loved about it, so that's kind of like the feeling that I wanted to convey in Furia. When I started writing the book, uh, I Although Furia is not my first published novel, it was one of the first manuscripts that I attempted to write uh, with the purpose to be published. But I, uh, back then I didn't know what I was doing. I had been mostly a reader and I didn't feel like I had the, the, the craft skills to tell the story that was in my heart. English is my second language, so I was very self-conscious about it. Uh, but one of the very first pieces of advice that I heard at writing workshops was to uh, be true to myself, it's tell the story that was in my heart and, um, and yes, just be honest and authentic. And so what was in my heart was football and Rosario. By then I had lived in the United States uh, for a long time. I hadn't been home for also a long time. I was the mom of four little kids and going back to Argentina was very difficult with all the family. So I was very homesick. So when my kids were taking their naps or uh, went to sleep early at night, I would just pour all of my love and all the things that I loved about Rosario in the pages uh, of the story. It was very difficult because I didn't want to portray only the things that were good about Rosario in Argentina. And at the same time, I didn't want to paint it in the stereotypical uh, way, you know, like in the broad strokes showing that Rosario, you know, uh, is a Latin American city. It's very, very big and there's a lot of crime. So I wanted to balance those things out and show a little more uh, realistic view of it, but at the same time, make my reader want to go there and visit one day. Uh, some of the media we get from Argentina is mostly from Buenos Aires, uh, with good reason, because Buenos Aires is just gorgeous, and there's so much history there, and, and we, uh, we have such a wealth of uh, literature icons like Borges and Cortázar, but uh, Argentina is such a big country and I had never seen or read a story or even watched the movie set in my hometown. And so Rosario is also the uh, cradle of football. Leo Messi was born there. So many famous soccer players were born there. And so it was only natural that I would write about a girl who loves soccer right there in the in a city that is obsessed with soccer. And although uh, it's not autobiographical at all, I, I placed Camila in the same neighborhood where I was born and raised. And I just tried to recreate all, all the things that I remembered. And when I was going through the very last round of edits, I had the fortune of going back to Argentina. It was right before the pandemic. And so I, I went back with the eyes of um, 
of somebody who had never been there. So try to catch all the little pieces of Rosario that I had never seen as a local. And I mean, that happens even here in Utah, there are so many beautiful places that I've never been to just because I live here. And I think that's uh, always uh, the case when we live somewhere, we don't know all the hidden treasures, but I was able to go to um, the, the monument and the river and even the, the Good Shepherd, the place where Camila tutors children. And it, it is a real place and that, uh, that uh, institution has a rich history of being a jail for disobedient daughters back in the day. And so uh, there are so many different pieces of Rosario's history that just matched perfectly the theme and the plot of the book that it seemed like I just had to find them and put them in the right place to tell the story. I think you did a really great job of that. <laughs> Thank you, I love that. <laughs> um, so my next question is for um, both Jean and Victoria, um, because those are our two graphic novels. Um, and I wanted to know whether you felt graphic novels um, particularly suited writing about sports, especially the action parts, um, and second part of the question, if you have any advice for um, anyone in our audience that might be thinking about becoming an artist or uh, a writer in graphic novels, um, maybe who want to follow in your footsteps. So um, who would like to take that one first? Uh, I'll go first. All right. Um, actually, Roller Girl was my very first graphic novel, so I don't think I knew what to expect or anticipate when I started this as a graphic novel. Um, my books before Roller Girl were picture books. So I, I always considered myself more of an illustrator. And actually I realized my first picture book was about sports also. I got very strange because I'm not an athlete. Um, but I think I had written you know, books for younger kids. And when I came to write Roller Girl, I wanted to write a, a longer story for slightly older readers. And I knew a picture book wasn't exactly right, even though my roller derby teammates and I had like a fun time trying to think of like picture books about roller derby, um, but it never really worked out. So I was very new to graphic novels at the time. And I just uh, picked up Raina Telgemeier's book, Smile, like I think a lot of people did at that time. Um, and that was, and it was an eye opener for me um, because I wasn't that used to graphic novels. Um, I never, I didn't really read comics as a kid. I was more into realistic stories, like Ramona was my jam when I was little. I love Ramona Fendi. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, an experiment and I just kind of jumped into it without knowing. I did a lot of Googling, like how to make a graphic novel, how to write a manuscript. So it was kind of, um, yeah, it's kind of all came together in just like a really wonderful way that I wasn't expecting. But you're right, I think it is really fun to have a graphic novel telling a sports story because yeah, you get to show a lot of action and um, you don't need to write a lot of description. I can show the action. I can show like girls flying through the air <laughs> and crashing down. Um, so yeah, that was really, uh, it was my introduction to graphic novels um, besides reading graphic novels. Um, and I just, I never look back. Like I love it so much. So I think graphic novels can tell so many stories. Um, yeah, it was, it was a great introduction. Thank you. And Jean? I, I'm uh, I'm pretty amazed that that's Victoria's first graphic novel. I mean, that's a uh, that's shocking. I don't know if I ever knew that. Like, we've been on panels before. I don't know if I've heard that story before. But um, but I did like like uh, in the same way that uh, Victoria looked at Raina Telgemeier's work when she was starting off. This is my very first sports book, so I did look at other sports graphic novels, including Roller Girl, actually, to see how you would portray action using still pictures. There's another. Um, set of graphic novels called uh, Slam Dunk, which is uh, like, like manga. And it's about a, a Japanese high school basketball team chasing after the national championship. But it's fiction. Um, and, and I think it's, it's both like uh, doing sports stories in graphic novels is both uh, awesome, but also really challenging. It's awesome in that you can see it, but it's challenging because the pictures are still not moving you know like like you're trying to portray movement with things that don't actually move so it's almost like you're trying to figure out how to trick the reader's brain into thinking these characters actually move and they're like they're like set parts of the the comics language that you can use like speed lines there are also ways in which you can like position 
the like the human body to to kind of convey movement, even though you're looking at a still picture. But I did look just like just like uh, just like Victoria. I looked at tons of examples, inclu including her book, um, to figure out how to do it. Uh, Mandy, I forgot the other half of your question. I'd love to hear Jean's advice on this too, because um, advice for young uh, young artists. Um, I think my advice again going back to the sports like you don't need to be the best it doesn't I know in middle school I remember um, trying to make friends and be like hey kids I like to draw and they're like oh actually Heidi's the artist in class and I was like oh there's already an artist so I can't be an artist like I for some reason I thought there could only be one <laughs> you had to be the best person to be an artist um and yeah same with sports you don't have to be the fastest person to enjoy doing sports to keep doing it so I'd say if you want to be an artist and you like to do it just keep doing it you know um, if you love it, even if you don't think you're the best, even if you compare yourself to others and think that my drawings aren't as good, like, none of that really matters. Just keep working at it and you will get better. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Victoria on this one too. I, I just think um, the, the, the whole idea of best is not actually super important when it comes to graphic novels. Like you, like being an awesome drawer and being an awesome graphic novelist are, they're related but they're not exactly the same thing. I have a friend named Jesse Ham who recently passed away, and this is a paraphrase of his advice. Um, but he was both a cartoonist and a teacher of cartoonists. And he would say, you know, um, inside of you is like a story. There's a story inside of you that the world needs to hear and no one else can tell it because it's your story. Even people who are better than you at writing and drawing, they still can't tell your story. So you just, you just gotta do it. That's really great advice. <laughs> Uh, thank you both. Um, and my next question is for Donna. Um, so in the book, Lupe does a lot of internet research about square dancing, and she's often shocked at what she finds, um, as I think she should be. Um, and I wanted to know what the weirdest thing you Googled when you were researching for this book was. Yeah, Google safely. <laughs> um, so... When I was researching this book, I was Googling. And I think the the part that kind of caught me off guard, I decided I had to research the origins of the song Cotton Eye Joe. And it's a really common song that people square dance to. It's one of the most well-known. And I'm like, wait a minute, what does that mean, Cotton Eye? And so I researched it and I found it very fascinating. It basically said that, um, the song started on plantations and Cotton Eye Joe was a supposed an enslaved person who made his rounds and on the plantations with the ladies and <laughs> Cotton Eye Joe, the cotton was either, they said either a cataract or a sexually transmitted disease. So I know this, that there are kids watching, <laughs> so I have to be cautious, but even when I was researching it, um, I found it fascinating. I'm an optometrist. So I was like, oh, what causes that? And I said, oh my gosh, it's chlamydia. <laughs> and so sure enough, I researched the history of the song and that's what it was. And then of course I said, okay, Lupe's 12. She would say, she would read this in Wikipedia, which is where I found it. And she would probably misspell or hear, or well, she initially found it on YouTube. And then it, she heard someone say the word. Well, how would you spell that? K-L-A-M. And sure enough, I typed K-L-A-M into Google. First thing that pops up is chlamydia. So it's like Google is very intuitive. And that was the weirdest thing I think I found. And I was like, wow, someone actually spent time creating a Wikipedia for this topic. <laughs> so anyway, I think that was probably the weirdest thing. And it's a little uncomfortable to talk about. But I think we have to do that. We have to talk about these things that anybody can go type something into the computer and find out about. And I do know that kids start studying that in fifth grade. So I think we're safe. But um, yeah, that was the weirdest thing and probably a little bit of a fascinating trivia fact that maybe I never needed to know in my life, but Lupe found it out. So it had to be in the book. Thank you. I also didn't know the origins of that song, so I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, more than you ever wanted to know. Definitely. And I'm glad that I didn't have to Google chlamydia and have that be like part of my algorithm from now on. Like you probably did. <laughs> I know. That's why I said Google safely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
My next question is for Shamile. Um, so in addition to sports, one of the threads running through the book is feminism, the state of feminism in Argentina. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what's different between the way feminism happens here in the U.S. and back home in Argentina. Well, I think the first difference is that it's not, it wasn't recognized as feminism from the very beginning. So soccer uh, was brought to Argentina by the very first uh, railroad workers uh, who were British at the end of the 1800s. And ever since then, women have been involved in the sport, but women were forbidden by law to play soccer until the 1950s and they could actually go to jail for it. So women who were still very passionate about this, uh, they would play at circuses, dressed as men or defying the law. And um, if it weren't for the fight of these early feminists who were not called that, they, they just, uh, they didn't have a unifying label, but they just wanted to be free to, to, to play the sport that they loved. We wouldn't have um, perhaps, you know, even a US a multi-champion national team. And so the fight for uh, equal rights has to be fought all over the world. Sometimes we, uh, just because we live in the United States, we think that every um, revolutionary movement starts here. But in fact, these, these different fights are being, uh, um, they're happening all over the world. And uh, also, in, in, uh, as I said, uh, when I introduced my book in 2014, the New Una Menos movement started. New Una Menos can be roughly just like, translated as not even one more or not even one less. And uh, it started as a, a petition for, for a, a stop of violence to women after the death of a young girl. And uh, these conversations had been happening uh, in our society since I was a young teenager. I remember a very a case that really marked my my adolescence, uh, my seventh grade year actually. And, um, but violence against women was actually kind of like a shush topic until the year 2014 that people, regardless of, of uh, gender, of orientation, took to the streets to, to demand for safety for women and children. And they would wear a green handkerchief like the Madres of Plaza de Mayo uh, wear a light blue handkerchief or a, a white handkerchief asking for the return of their disappeared children from the dictatorship. So it was kind of like an evolution of, of, of the feminist movement. And so women have always been um, at the forefront of uh, demanding democracy at the end of the 70s, equal rights, uh, all through um, the history of the country and specifically lately. So um, even those people who don't consider themselves feminists are uh, still very loud um, supporters of equal rights. Argentina has had women presidents throughout history. I mean, we, uh, we don't have, you know, um, some of the same uh, obstacles that women have in the United States, but at the same time, there is a lot of violence still um, that is perpetrated against the weakest members of society, which are usually uh, women and children. And so I felt that it wouldn't be a, an honest story about soccer if I didn't include the history that 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 happened in, in the backstage of the sport, because we all see the victories, especially Argentina, uh, the men's soccer team has won uh, multiple world championships and they've been very successful, but the women have always played in the background. And it wasn't until 2018 that it actually became a professional sport. Furia had already sold by then. So um, this whole time that I was working on it, women couldn't even play and, and be compensated for it. And still, when the women played in the World Cup in France in 2019, um, our team didn't do spectacularly well, but it was still a success because it was the first time that, that I could remember that everyday people were cheering for the women's team, that they knew these players' names as well as they knew the men's. And so I feel like even though there's still a lot of progress to be made, we have come a long ways, even from the days in which I was a teenager. Yes, thank you. Um, 
That's one thing that I really loved about your book was how I, I, I learned a little bit of Argentine history while I was reading it without even thinking that I was reading a history book, which was great. Um, I had that same experience um, with Donna's book as she touched on um, kind of Googling the origin of some of those songs. And Jean, um, you did a really great job um, sort of weaving the history of basketball and, and some of the uh, less than uh, stellar aspects of the history of basketball in terms of um, how black, black players were treated specifically. Um, was, were you worried about including that not, not as nice history in your book? Well, I, I wasn't planning on it when I first proposed the book. I proposed the book as like a 200 page nonfiction graphic novel and it just kept growing and, and it ended up being like 440 something pages long. Um, but I was reading about basketball history. I was reading all these history books about basketball as I was following that team because I felt really self-conscious about doing a book about basketball and not really knowing anything about the sport. So at first it was just a way of me educating myself um, about the history of basketball. But then I realized that what I was reading in these books was affecting how I was watching these, these games, you know? So for example, um, we'd go to these games and there'd be players of every kind of cultural background that you could think of on the court. And it was just like, it's Oakland, right? So you kind of just take it for granted that it's like that. But then when I read about things like the, um, you know, the Harlem Globetrotters versus the Lakers uh, back in the 1930s, I realized that, no, this is actually something that people fought really hard for. This is people, people actually put their, you know, physical bodies on the line in order to make this happen. So it made me feel like there was a certain sense of gratitude that came over me just by watching a bunch of kids playing on this court because of what I'd read about basketball history. So I wanted to include that into the book so that the reader could could kind of feel those same things that I was feeling. Thank you. Um, my next question is an, an audience question. We, we only had one come in, but it's stellar. So um, it's, uh, it's for Victoria, but I think it's a really great question for all of you. So after she um, finishes giving her answer, I'd like all of you to have an opportunity if you want to, to answer this question. Um, so this is from Lauren in Fort Worth. Um, and she writes uh, that Astrid realizes that she's strong enough to do hard things. Um, and she wants to know what advice you would give to readers who are also trying to find that inner strength to do something really hard. Hmm. Wow, that is a really stellar question. Wow. It is. Um, yeah, so in the book, I feel like Astrid is able to do hard things because she knows, she just knows that she wants it, even if she can't do it right away. Kind of like you said, she started off not being able to skate. And um, yeah, I think there's plenty of things in life that we want, but you have no idea how to get there. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you could take advice from what everyone has said so far. I think um, research is a big part of, you know, achieving your dreams. Um, so for me, like, I'd never written a graphic novel before. I knew I wanted to do it. So it just required a lot of research. I never gave up on the dream, even though sometimes I felt pretty ridiculous for wanting to start it. And I think that happens in the book too. Um, but yeah, I think if you kind of don't give up on it and going back to the drawing advice, try not to compare yourself to others. That happens in Roller Girl too, where Astrid is skating and then finally she learns how to skate but everyone else seems so much better than she is and it's easy at those points to say like well I'll never get as good as those people why should I even bother I'll never catch up I'm so far behind but I think if you hold on to the part of you that loves what you're trying to do and don't forget about what brought you to the first place I guess that would be my advice um try not to think about the end goal but how much you love what you're doing and that will see you through Anybody else like to tackle that? I can speak to that. It was one of the things that came up in the book when Lupe has a conversation with her grandfather and she's upset about this square dancing thing that she thinks is ridiculous. And he kind of gives her the advice that you don't always have to defeat things. You don't always have to conquer those things. Sometimes you can accept what's going to happen and then just slowly learn a craft. You don't have to be, again, the best right away. You don't have to 
conquer something. And I think that's, you know, we, we, in sports, I was not an athlete. I wasn't the best. I had a sister who was a, a all state athlete in three sports. And it was really difficult to be alongside her. I was more of the nerdy kid, but I wanted, I grew up playing fast pitch and I was a catcher and I was not that great. I was small. I was, you know, I was five, four and 115 pounds. And even when I played in college, I just got beat up, but I just, I wasn't great, but I just kept doing it because I love the sport and you, I wasn't the best, but part of the reason we do things is things are is for the love of something, whether, whether it's sports, whether it's writing a book, whether it's being an artist. And so it's okay to do things just because you love them. And when, you know, when a character in a book decides to do something, it's maybe just because they want to, or because they love it. And it's okay to do that in life. You don't have to be the absolute best or conquer something all the time. That's great advice. I can also add to that because in my story, Camila, uh, how she starts is naming all the women in her family who ignore their dreams or put them aside for their families. So she wants to be different. She wants to be the one to break the cycle. Uh, in her family, although uh, there is a lot of violence outside of uh, her home uh, and her family is so protective of her, sometimes the greatest threat for her happens inside her home. And so throughout the story, uh, when Camila wanted to be so different from the woman in her family tree, and especially her mother, she comes to terms with the knowledge that she is who she is because of the, of the struggle of the woman who came before her, and that she can live the life that she's leading and have the dreams that she has and, and have a better future because of the sacrifices that came before her. And so the story of her achieving her dreams, in a way, is also a story of her, of the redemption of her, of her family, especially the women. And so when she finally reaches her, her final dream, and uh, she realizes that she's fulfilling the dreams of generations before her. And so sometimes we believe that we are doing a lot of things on our own. And in fact, uh, we have, we have people to support us, uh, whether it's a team, whether it's a mentor as a teacher or the members of our family. And even if writing is a solitary endeavor, I, was so, I am only able to tell my stories because of the team that surrounds me. And so uh, sometimes uh, it's easy to, to believe that we're alone in, this, in, in whatever struggle we're facing. But if we look around us, we, we can realize that even if we're physically alone, we, we carry all the hopes and the dreams of, of the people that came before us and that paved the way, even those ancestors who are not related by blood, but the people who pioneered a certain sport or an art or any other um, um, dream that, that, that we're uh, shooting for. And so, and that is my, my advice that we can look for for these mentors uh, to help us and guide us. And that at the same time, even if we don't intend to, we are uh, trailblazing for the people who, who come after us. And so there's always somebody watching and being inspired. Even if we don't believe our story is inspiring, uh, there might be somebody who may dare to dream only because we did. I 100% I agree with that. I think I think finding your team is so important. I I saw that with the Bishop of Dad Dragons. You know um, what they were doing was really difficult. Every every high school basketball player wants to win the California State Championship in California, right? Um, and, but because they were such a cohesive team, because they supported each other, they were able to do it. And I see that with my own journey as a cartoonist as well. Early on when I was in my 20s, just starting off, I fell in with a group of other cartoonists in the San Francisco Bay Area. We used to meet every week to, to talk about our craft, to look at each other's work. Uh, now all of us are working in comics or animation in, in some capacity. And I just don't think I would have been able to put out you know, a single book without the support that I got from my cartoonist friends. It's all about finding your people sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a few questions for um, that anyone can answer. Um, and, you know, we're doing this uh, virtually on Zoom, which is great because um, we get to talk to people who aren't here in Irving with us. Um, 
but it's also because we're living through this pandemic. Um, and I was wondering how it has changed your writing life, if it has. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of our audience are doing virtual school or school with masks on. Um, things have changed for them a lot too. Um, but I think they might be interested to hear how it changes for a writer. And anyone can answer. Well, I can go first. At the beginning of the pandemic, my children made fun of me because they said my lifestyle didn't change at all because so I'm in my writing studio and just, you know, typing away. But although, um, you know, like I said before, writing is solitary, I still miss interacting with people. So for a time, it was very sad uh, not to be able to cheer my friends when their books came out and go to library events or celebrate the publication of, of two of my books that took me years and years of work to finally see published, like Foodie and, and My Middle Grade that came out earlier that year called On These Magic Shores. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, I, I let myself uh, feel my feelings and be sad for, for the opportunities lost, but also recognize the amazing things that were happening. Because of all the virtual events, I was able to connect with readers all over the world uh, whom perhaps I wouldn't have reached. And, uh, and then it also, I realized how important stories are because when we were all at home, nobody could go out. The thing that kept me going and kept my family going were movies and books and music. And it's the arts that kept me hoping that things would get better. And so sometimes when I'm working on, on my next manuscript and I become a little discouraged, I remember uh, the notes that I received from readers saying how much uh, one of my books had helped them or how they had a family um, reading group for the first time instead of meeting with their friends. And, and those were things that uh, motivated me to keep going. And, and so in, in turn, I remembered to, to let artists know when their, when their work touched my heart too and how it made my life better and gave me hope when things were really dark. Um, I can say it was really difficult to focus. I had a hard time writing. I think that a lot of us, whether it's, you know, and I, even in my daughter doing virtual school, it was hard for her to focus. I think we can be honest and say the pandemic, there's just kind of this constant like rumble of stress behind us. And tr as artists, it's really difficult to create art and to write. At least it was for me during the pandemic, I was really fortunate because I did, I was doing a lot of editing instead. I had a book that's coming out. And so editing is fun. I know a lot of people hate editing, but to me, it's like a puzzle. You get to go in and take out the pieces that aren't working and fit in other pieces that are the right part there. And yeah, it's hard, but it's a little bit more technical than writing involves a lot of imagination. And I think that maybe when there's the stress of a pandemic, that's a little more difficult. And why I think it's, we need to, you know, be honest with ourselves and even kids going to school need to be able to say, Hey, I'm having a hard time focusing. This is not easy. And it's okay to say, to say those things. But um, yeah, I spent most of the time editing. I was, I was editing this book, which comes out in October shameless pitch, the last Quintista. And, um, and it's, uh, again, it's a middle grade, but it's sci-fi. So there's this technical part of it too, that was, it was good to have something like that. There's, there's a lot of science in it. So researching those things made it a little, it felt a little bit less like I had to come up with ideas. They were there before me. I just did, had to make them fit in the right spot. I was kind of in the same boat. I was kind of halfway through a project when the pandemic started. That's one good thing about graphic novels taking forever to finish. <laughs> so I was kind of halfway through and I was like, well, I still got like another two years to work on this. So I'd done a lot of the hard work. And so a lot of the pandemic, I just tried to escape into drawing, which is like my happy place. So it was actually, I was so, so happy to have this book that I'm working on now to kind of see me through some of the hard parts. Um, and I think another bright spot, you know, I think you've all touched very eloquently on the dark spots. We all know it's, it's really hard. Um, but one of the bright spots for me, the pandemic was staying closer to home 
And I think, Shamila, you mentioned like exploring your own backyard. And that was something I hadn't really done. I live in Pennsylvania. And so every week, my son and I would go on, like, on a field trip and we'd go to another state park that was near us or, or I guess they're all state parks. And I was seeing lots of things that were an hour's drive for me that are so beautiful that I'd never seen before. So I don't think I'm in the right mind space now to, you know, incorporate that into my work, but I know I will someday. Yeah. So I know a lot of this past year and a half feels kind of wasted or, you know, we've lost so many things. And yeah, I think it's great. It's right to grieve that stuff, but I'm hopeful that the things that we gained, I'll, I'll be able to use later in my life. And I try and appreciate the things that were beneficial in this past year too, like spending lots, lots of time with my kid. <laughs> I, I, I had the same thing about um, not being able to concentrate. So I, I used to um, write in a workspace that was outside of my house. Uh, and I, I actually just started using it again this week. But uh, after pandemic started, I stopped going to that. And I think like a lot of us, the, the division between where our work life ends and where our family life begins just kind of evaporated. So my wife and I, we have uh, four kids and um I was just uh, looking for any empty space I could in my house to, to work for, for a couple of months. Like I, if one of my kids was out of their bedroom, I'd go into their bedroom to work, you know, for a little while when the weather was okay and the air was okay. I was using a, uh, like a little fold up table in our backyard, just anywhere I could find some quiet, I would go. Um, but, but like Victoria said, there are also benefits, right? Like my, um, my son just went to college as a freshman uh, last week. So even though his senior year sucked, um, the, the, the bright, like the silver lining around that cloud is that I got to spend a lot of time with him before he left. And I'm, I'm pretty thankful for that. All right. Thank you. Um, and I have one more question for all of us to, um, talk just a little bit about, and then we'll do a lightning round and then we'll wrap up. Um, so I wanted to know, um, if there was a particular book um, that you read when you were younger that made you want to become a writer? If you could tell us what those book, book or books were. I've already mentioned mine. Mine was Ramona Quimby. Um, I read that those books over and over and over again. I didn't know I wanted to be a writer then, but those books definitely made me a reader. And so any of you kids who are rereading books, I think that's great. I reread Ramona now as a grown up, and it always gives me something new. So if you love something and want to reread it, I say go for it. This is a, such a loaded question for me because <laughs> there are so many. But when I was a kid, I I read a lot of um, Tolkien. I you know read The Hobbit, and I just I loved it. And then I kind of as a kid, it was just my imagination. I loved reading. It was called Mysteries of the Unexplained. And I think it was like a Reader's Digest book. And I would just devour it. And my mind would, I go, these are mysteries, but I can come up with the answer. And I would like write out like what Stonehenge really was and like, you know, go through all these scenarios. And then when I was older, I will say the book I read when I was older, where I was like, okay, I need to write. Why, you know, I love what I do. I'm in healthcare. I love it. It's, it's been draining the last year, but when I was, I probably about 15 years ago now, I, I read the first Harry Potter book and I was like, I wanted to be a writer. Why did I not do that? And I started writing and taking classes and studying the craft of writing. And then the, the book I read, because I always wrote fantasy and sci-fi and I read um, Because of Winn-Dixie and I'm like, I need to write a contemporary. And that was where I wrote Lupe Wong Won't Dance. I loved the characters in that book and they felt like family. And I was like, I can do this. It wasn't necessarily just about the plot of the book, but about falling in love with characters and how they become part of you and part of family. And I like, I want to write a character that people feel like they really know. And Lupe's often compared to Ramona because she's a little bit rambunctious and, and, uh, but yeah, I think for me, Lupe is a character that people feel like they know by the end of the book. And it's, I think books make us want to be better writers. I'm sure there'll be another book that will make me want to write something else at some point. Yeah. I, I really love those Ramona books as well. Uh, I also loved a, a, a set of fantasy books that I, like people don't really talk about as much. The, the Lloyd Alexander uh, Book of Three. 
<laughs> right? I, <laughs> yeah, I try to get my kids into it. I don't, I don't know if I don't like one of my one of my daughters is especially into Harry Potter, so I thought she'd be a natural, but maybe I didn't sell it right. But maybe I should try again. But I love those books. I read them over and over again. And then in terms of comics, there was a the, the very first comic in my collection was DC Comics Presents number 57 starring Superman. It was about uh, Superman in this post-apocalyptic world where there were these uh, people who were dressed up as knights riding these giant mutated dogs. And, and I think that, that book just kind of blew my mind and it, it was the beginning of my comic book collection. I love that. I was such an avid reader that I would just read anything that had a new print on it, like even the back of the, you know, the toothpaste tooth, whatever I could get my hands on, I would read. But especially the stories that made me a writer were Little Women, I wanted to be Joe, and she was a writer, but I didn't know what to write about. Nothing seemed interesting enough. And then I read The Little Prince, and it, that book taught me to always think of the child that still lived inside me, even as I was growing up. And then I also read uh, two Argentine authors who are not known in the United States, but they're very well known um, in other places of the world, in Latin America and Europe. And they were um, Alma Maritano and uh, Elsa Borneman. And they wrote contemporary stories about kids like me in Argentina and doing everyday things. And Elsa Borneman wrote horror for young audiences. So that kind of explains why my writing is so eclectic too, that I love to write anything from picture book to middle grade and YA and even adult and, and horror. And so I feel like there's a little bit of that young reader in me in everything uh, that I write for different age groups or, or genres. Okay. So um, we're gonna do our quick lightning round um, and then we'll wrap up. So um, the way that the lightning round usually works in a panel is that people just shout out an answer, but because this is done virtually, I'm going to call on you. Um, so make sure that you have your mics on. <laughs> and this is a sports-based lightning round, which is different for me, but we're gonna give it a try. Um, and because we just went through the Olympics, I want to know your favorite summer Olympic, summer Olympic sport, Jean. I high jump because I used to do it in high school and, and it was fancy this year right it was super exciting this year Jamile? gymnastics <laughs> Victoria gymnastics and Donna same makes my palms sweat I have to watch gymnastics <laughs> I love it uh this year was my son's first time watching the Olympics really and he also gravitated toward the gymnastics it's mm -hmm. just such a cool sport um yeah. All right, and then favorite winter Olympic sport, Jean. Ooh, maybe downhill skiing. Jamile? Ice dancing. <laughs> Victoria? Figure skating. And Donna? Figure skating, yeah. I, bet, I love the watching the dancing, but figure skating is, it's tense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then finally, I wanted to know, um, what sport you would be the absolute worst at, Jean? I think it's basketball. I, I proved that when I was a kid. Shamile? Swimming. <laughs> I'm not a confident swimmer still. <laughs> Victoria? Uh, maybe football. I tried to do power puff when I was in high school and it was a disaster. I'll go with football, like American football. And Donna? Um, I know this answer. It was volleyball. I tried. It was awful. <laughs> awesome. Um, so that's going to wrap us up. Um, thank you guys so much, first of all, for appearing on this panel with me. And second, for writing these amazing books. Um, I know that Donna was able to show us her next book. Would anyone else like to give a little preview or shout out to your next project that's coming out? Well, I have my first series coming out next year. It's called Horse Country, and the first book, Can't Be Tamed, will be out from Scholastic in April of 2022. Okay. And it's surreal that 2022 is three months away. Oh, my gosh. Coming up <laughs> quick. Yes. <laughs> I have another shout-out for my oh, yeah. another book, if I can. Yeah. Yes. This is a picture book. It just came out. It's called El Kukui is Scared Too, and I don't know if it's got shine from the sun, but... Um, El Kukui is 
uh, kind of like the Mexican boogeyman. I don't know how that he's in, in other Latin American countries. He's like El Coco or La Cuca. There's, you know, all over the place, but he's horrifying. But this is a picture book with Abrams kids that came out, gosh, a few weeks ago, not long ago. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, my next book that I kind of teased that was giving me so much joy during the pandemic, um, it's a graphic novel version of the Disney film, The Parent Trap. Um, oh, I got to see my, um, <laughs> in my own direction and it was so much fun. I love that movie to an obscene level. And so just writing a graphic novel about it was wonderful. I can't wait till it comes out. It'll be out in fall 2022. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. This is an upcoming, but uh, it's the last book to come out after Dragon Hoops. It's Superman Smashes the Clan from DC Comics about the Man of Steel taking down bigots and bed sheets. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, and we're looking forward to all of those books. And uh, I hope you guys had a good time on the panel. Yeah. And that is it from us. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.